Uh, my name is Mike Armstrong and um, I guess what inspired me to, to get involved in hang gliding was uh, the same as I think a lot of little boys and probably lots of little girls. It's just I was fascinated by any kind of flying. and used to run around with my, my arms out like this and I remember me and a pal jumping off a, a, a big stone wall with an umbrella and trying to parachute and uh, that sort of thing. So that's what I guess got the interest going initially. Um, but it was probably in my early 20s that I started to become aware of, of hang gliding and the fact that you could actually fly like a bird, you know, with, without an engine, which was the big thing, you know. Um, so yeah, that was, that was what it was. And so when did you begin hang gliding? When did, when did you start? Uh, I began hang gliding, uh, well I started the, the training course on the 5th of August 1984, so 31 years ago. Can you describe what the training course involved? Um, it was it was very like the, the 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 training course itself. I suppose was a bit like learning to ski in the sense of it's very gradual. They don't just suddenly throw you off off the side of a mountain kind of thing. So um, initially we we started running around with a hang glider on our shoulders on on flat ground. Um, this was up in Glenshee uh, at, at the ski ski area. Um, Again, as I say, always on the flat ground to start with. And the guy that um, taught us was uh, Gustav Fischneller, an Austrian, who uh, used to, well, he ran the ski school in Glenshee through the winter. And then he kind of made ends meet by teaching hang gliding through the summer. So it was basically run around with a, a glider on your, your shoulder on the, the flat ground and then just gradually go to shallow slopes and... Uh, I think on the first or second day they, they um, tethered us, which was on a bit more of a slope um, and with a bit of a breeze coming up it and there was somebody on the nose with a rope and somebody on each wing with a rope and they just launched you like a kite and you basically weren't really doing much, you weren't exactly controlling it but you got the feel of how it all worked and the position you were flying in and that sort of thing. Um, but the feeling was just stunning, you know, oh my God, I'm off the ground, <laughs> I'm flying. And uh, for, I remember that that was when I was hooked. I really thought, this is for me. Well, the, the first time I was let loose uh, on a hang glider, again, it was on, on these training slopes and you would start by just doing a, a kind of a, a straight flight, you know, straight and level, no turns, and then hopefully just land at the bottom straight into wind because um, you always take off facing the wind and you try and land facing the wind as well um, and then you do several of them and when the instructor is happy with you you would build in a, a few turns you'd maybe do one right turn and then one left turn and then come straight again and land um, and then you gradually built up and you go to maybe further and further up the slope and slightly higher and maybe a few more turns and then eventually, when, when he was happy that you were in control and knew what you were doing, he would take you to, to do your high flight, which for me took two weeks to get to that point. And um, it was off the Cairnwell Mountain uh, at Glenshee, which I think is almost a thousand metres high, but it's probably about a 1,500 feet top to bottom. But it's a very, the point that you take off from is, is quite a steep edge. It's not a cliff as such, but you are suddenly a long way off the ground, whereas on the training slopes you were never more than maybe 20, 30 feet off, off the ground. And then, but suddenly you were hundreds of feet off the ground and you're seeing these tiny little sheep that, that just looked like a tiny little speck of wool way below you. And it was really quite kind of mind-blowing and freaked you out a wee bit. But uh, I survived anyway. And you do a few of them before he's prepared to sign you off and say, right, you can go out into the, the world of the the hang gliding clubs and and fly of your own off your own back sort of thing. Um, and did how did you feel emotionally when you did, did that first? Terrified. <laughs> 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 I think uh, definitely white knuckles and uh, you're supposed to be relaxed, but it was just it was just the difference between you know thirty or forty feet off the ground and then hundreds of feet off the ground. And I, I'm not even. I don't think I'd even ever flown in any form of plane at that that point. I'd certainly never been in a passenger jet or anything like that and just this sudden uh, really 
bizarre feeling of being hundreds of feet up there and everything looks so different. So terrified would be the answer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when did you purchase your air, airwave magic test? Uh, I th it would be around 89 or 1990. Um, it was certainly around the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. I can't exactly tell you when. Unfortunately, all my, my, the logbook I used to keep and log every single flight, it was stolen one time when my car was broken into. So I have no record. Well, I, I have one record of that that I can show you, um, but I've no sort of personal record of all the individual flights. So I can't tell you exactly when it was that I was flying the kiss, um, unfortunately. But you've been flying for a, a few years already. By then I would have been flying six or seven years, yeah. And what was it in, that inspired you to choose that handwriting? Um, I guess the reason I bought an Airwave Kiss was I was already flying Airwave gliders. Um, and in Britain there was two main manufacturers that, that most people flew one or the other. There were a couple of other smaller manufacturers but at the time I was you know at that time um, it was Airwave and a company called Solar Wings and for whatever reason I went down the, the Airwave route and they, they had already an Airwave Magic and they had a Magic and then a Magic 2 and then a Magic 3 and a Magic 4 and I think from memory I definitely had a Magic 4 in fact I probably had two of them um, and then the magic kiss came along and it just seemed to be a real, because all, all of the, the magic one, two, three and four, there wasn't really much of a difference between them all. It was just a, a bit like, you know, a Ford Fiesta and then another Ford Fiesta comes along and it's not that, that much different or not that much better. But suddenly this magic kiss was the next step on and it had more performance not necessarily better handling actually but but the performance could be used uh, once you got used to the handling of it um, and so that was that was why I, I moved on to a magic kiss. And can you explain when you say more performance in what sense is there? Mostly a bit more speed uh, but better glide because uh, that's that's the main thing that you're looking for in a hang glider is is a, a better glide angle. Um, so when when hang gliding first came out, they were probably gliding at maybe four to one, which would be uh, one foot down for every four feet forward, and then gradually it gets better. So they maybe got to ten to one, so you were you going one foot down for every ten feet forward. Um, so that that's. The, the big difference with the Magic Kiss would have been it had a better glide angle. I probably couldn't accurately tell you the, the numbers involved in that, that step in technology, but, but it definitely was a, an amazing glider. Okay. Um, and what was it like to fly? Do you remember your first flight on it? Um, I don't... I probably don't actually remember my first flight on the Magic Kiss. Um, other than maybe a test flight, but, but my own glider, I, I don't particularly remember it, but I remember when the, the demo gliders came around the country and there was a real buzz about it. And, um, probably the only people that, that, that weren't buzzing about it were the die-hard Solar Wings pilots, um, but they would have then had their kind of equivalent model coming out around the, the same time as well. But there was a real buzz that, oh, this, this glider is so much better. Than, than what we've been flying, and this is the next big thing. So everybody wanted one, basically. Um, and I, I was wondering, you mentioned um, in our correspondence that you did one flight on Magic Kiss where you reached 11,000 feet. And yeah. I was wondering if you could describe that, that experience. And um, the, the, there was a flight that uh, I and several other people, funnily enough, all on magic kisses, uh, got to above 11,000 feet in Scotland. Um, and it was at a competition, uh, a, a Scottish competition, Scottish League weekends we used to call them. 
and uh, it was on the 31st of August 1991 um, and we were flying from the Cairnwell uh, all, the, all the Scottish competitions used to go up to the Cairnwell and we eventually abandoned that because the weather's so so unpredictable up there but this one day there was really quite special conditions for us um, and it wasn't a classic hot sunny thermal type flying day it was like we had wave conditions anyway the, the, um, we all took off and we the people that started climbing and getting high knew immediately it was a real special day um, because everybody else was really low down or landing it was either you got up in this wave lift or you didn't so um, three of us got to 11,400 feet and we were all flying together and we ended up flying um, to near Forres from the Cairnwell in Glenshee, which is something like, I think, 76 kilometres, which in those days was quite far on a hang glider. And uh, we were talking to each other on radio and taking photographs, and because it was quite amazing being up that high. Uh, I've got some photographs I can show you. Um, and I, I remember that we were all speaking to each other on um, airband radios and kind of just, instead of competing with each other, we're just enjoying the view and saying, wow, look at this. Um, and then suddenly somebody else came on the radio and it was a Logan Air pilot. And he was saying, I've been listening to you guys on the radio. Are you really flying hang gliders? And we said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, um, and how high are you? And we said, 11,400 feet. And he said, I'm only 8,000 feet. <laughs> so it was really it kind of just full of wonder, this flight. And um, some of the guys that, that hadn't got up in this, because um, if you fly cross country, somebody has to come and get you and bring you back. And there was a friend called Donald McKenzie who had landed and he'd be spitting blood that we were way up and so high and flying so far. But um, he very uh, graciously came chasing after us in his car. But of course, at that height and no, no roads to follow, you're just straight lining and um, and of course, every time we were able to keep climbing at other points. And I think at one point we were over Balmoral Castle uh, at about 8,000 feet by then. Anyway, he's chasing along, speaking to us on, on the radio. And uh, he got to the Lecht ski area. And uh, he spoke to us on the radio and said, I can't see you guys, but I know you're around here because I heard you say you're passing the lake. He said, whatever you do, don't land here because it's blowing 40 miles an hour on the ground. The wind's 40 miles an hour on the ground. And we just said, Donald, there's no way we're landing there because we're still at 8,000 feet. <laughs> and uh, he didn't answer. <laughs> but eventually we landed and it was such a weird day with these wave conditions that we landed in absolutely no wind at all at... Um, just south of Forest. Right. And so can you explain to me the, the wave, how that's formed and what, what the conditions need to be for that to happen? Um, well, I'm not really a meteorologist, but uh, wave lift is quite different uh, from thermal lift in that thermals tend to just be a, like a bubble of air, warm air that, that goes up and you, <coughs> excuse me, you circle in it, just like you see birds circling. Whereas wave lift tends to be kind of, if, if you see these lenticular sort of sausage shaped clouds in the sky, that, that indicates there's wave lift. And it's basically that the air's just oscillating like that. And usually you need like a stable layer of air and an unstable layer of air and then another stable layer of air sandwiching it. And the, the, the air oscillates between. So the, the clouds mark where the where the wave lift is. And if you fly in front of the cloud, it's a bit like a hill. You know, if we soar a hill, uh, it's a bit like a hill in the middle of the sky that you can just soar up the front of and sometimes over the top of. And did you compete in a lot of competitions then? Was that something you were quite involved in? Uh, in those days, I was just competing in the Scottish competitions, but I've since started competing and still am in, uh, UK competitions and some foreign competitions, yeah. And can you explain what, what's 
what's involved in a competition? What are you being judged on? Right, a, a, a hang gliding competition is, is a distance competition with a race element. So um, these days, well, in, in that the Scottish competition that I was telling you about, it was basically they would say, right, guys, take off and fly as far as you can in any direction you want, <laughs> which is mainly downwind uh, in this country and hang gliders. But uh, competitions now, it is similar, but they'll tell you, where you have to go. Um, so they'll say, right, you're taking off at this hill here today and we'll open the, the launch window at a certain time. And you have to fly, say, 40 kilometers to a certain point and they'll give you the coordinates for it. And then after that, you have to fly to another point with a coordinate and then to a goal field or, or a, a, almost a virtual goal field, excuse me. Um, again with the coordinates so you, you basically have to, to follow, your, follow the route that they give you um, and you evidence that these days with um, a GPS tracker and then you just hand that in uh, at the scoring room at the end of the day and they verify what you've done. Uh, back in the, the days uh, of these old Scottish competitions you had to take a photograph of uh, where you'd been um, but they usually weren't turn points. It was usually just take off and land as far away as you can and try not to, well, avoid breaking airspace. Um, but these days it's all quite technologically advanced. You've got GPS and sophisticated flight computers and that sort of thing. And so the day you, you were describing when you flew from Glenshaw to Forest, who, who won that day? Well, <laughs> the, the, the day that we flew in the, the wave from uh, the Cairnwell at Glen Shee and the, the day we got to the 11,400 feet, there was, I think I said earlier that, and I think this was purely coincidental, but the only f people that got up in the wave that day, and certainly the only people that got high in it were flying magic kisses. So I think that's a measure of how good the glider was. But um, three of us, I managed to fly to forest together um, and we all landed in the same field and when uh, the chap that came and collected us, Donald McKenzie, drove us back to Glen Shee uh, to hand our scores in, we were, you know, we thought we were <laughs> the bee's knees and the best ever, you know, and we've got a real story to tell. But then somebody said, did you not hear about Richard Parson? And so it was the, the three that flew to forest was myself, a chap called Adrian Loning and a chap called Simon Ogston. Uh, neither of those two are still flying, but there was a, a chap called Richard Parson um, from, he was New Zealand and I think he's back in New Zealand now. I don't know if he's still flying, but he also flying a magic kiss had um, taken a slightly different route from us and had gone further west on his way north and he got to 16,200 feet <laughs> over Inverness. And apparently he started going a bit hypoxic, which is, you know, oxygen starvation. And he was still climbing 